So there's a, some things you might be wondering. For example, let's look at broadcast, no, not broadcast, scatter, okay? Scatter takes some data, splits it up and sends it. So if I've got, uh, if I've got 10 processes and I've got 10 integers, it sends one integer to each process, okay? So the f A goes to process A, B goes to process B. But you look at the prototype, you think, well, wait a second. I have to specify the send count and the send type and the receive count and the receive type. Isn't that a bit stupid? Surely the send count and the send type and the re So, you know, in normal usage, send count would be one, send type would be MPI integer, receive count would be one, receive type would be MPI integer. Why do I have to specify them multiple times? So if you're sending basic types like ints, reals, doubles, whatever, then send count will equal receive count and send type will equal receive type. However, it, after the lecture that we're about to do on derived data types, hopefully you'll have some understanding of why actually it's possible to use different uh, types. Types can match even if they're not the same. Um, and that's, that's the feature of derived types. So I'm now going to go into the derived types lecture. Okay. So MPI has basic types, but it also has derived types. So just like C has basic types, int, double, no, it doesn't have double. Yes, it does. Int, double, float, is when I get wrong, float, whatever. You can have derived types, your own types. Within a C program, you can create structures. And, and they're treated almost as if they're just um, basic types. But they don't exist till the program runs. But you can, and in, in, in Fortran now, you can create things which I think Fortran calls derived types, which are the same thing. So you might ask, if I've got an array of structures, how do I send that? Because you might, in my program, you might be doing a molecular dynamics program with, to do with particles. Your fundamental object in your program might be particles, which might have an integer ID uh, and an X, Y, Z position and maybe some other double precision value like their mass or something. So if that's your fundamental object, you'd like to be able to send five particles or receive five particles, just like you can send five doubles and receive five, five doubles. And it turns out you can do that. But that's slightly contorted, but you can do it. There's also vectors, which is I'll come to, but you know, at the moment we've seen how to send an array. But what happens if I want to send every third element of an array? How do I do that? Do I have to make a copy? Well, you don't. So the, der the derived types I'm going to cover here, which are vectors and structs, are really quite different, but they in use, but fundamentally they, they, you, they're dealt with in the same way. So if basic data, if I want to send all 10 values, okay, so I do an integer x10 or int x10, this is my array and I want to send the red values, okay, what do I do? Well, I just do MPI send x10 integers or MPI send x10 integers, okay, that's, that's obvious, okay. How do I send the first four values? This isn't right, just guess. Anyone think, what do I do? X4, right. X4. How do I send the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth values? Yeah, so what do I change it to? Sorry, some, uh, someone just. Uh, yes, yeah. So you, what were you going to say? Sorry, that's... Well, MPI doesn't actually... All MPI actually gets is in, in, as a pointer. So here you're sending... Send 10 values starting from here. Send 4 values starting from here. If you want to send 5, 6, 7, and 8, you want to say send 4 values starting from here. Okay, so you just pass that location. Yeah, or I think or what really means is the address of x4, which is x plus 4, but this is sort of more, or in, in Fortran it doesn't matter, you just, you, again, Fortran you just pass x5, which is that element. So, so, so that's, that's obvious, but what happens if I want to send an array of 10 structures, okay, well, how do I do that, okay, or, so how do I do this, how do I do an array of 10 structures, okay, can't do that because we, we don't know what type it is. How do I send these? How do I send that element, that element, that? Well, I could, could do it. What's one way I could do it? How can I send those, those values? 
multiple sends exactly. I could do a send of x, the first two and the second two. However, it's very important to notice, I haven't really, we're not talking about performance here, but you need to understand that if I'm sending small messages where small is anything under a kilobyte, let's say, the time is dominated by the latency. It takes an identical amount of time to send one integer as it takes to send two, right? It's just, so, so sending two messages will take twice as long as sending one, okay? Because it's all the coordination and stuff, and then the actual payload is nothing, okay? So you do not want to send multiple messages. So you could copy them. You could copy that data into a contiguous array and send it, but that's pretty ugly. There are ways to send this data directly. Just say, pick these values out. So to send this kind of stuff where I've defined um, my own type, I need to create uh, MPI structures which, can, which correspond to my, my, um, my structure. And in this thing, we create things called vectors which correspond to strided patterns. So the motivation is send receive calls need a data type argument and for predefined values, there are predefined, for each language type, there are predefined values. So real is MPI, real int is MPI int. But what about types defined by a program, structures in C or user defined types? Now, if MPI were a compiler, it would be fine because the compiler would just look at your definition of the structure and say, well, I can see what the structure looks like, that's fine. But MPI isn't a compiler, it's a bunch of library routines. So what you have to do is you create a structure, you unfortunately have to define it twice. You have to define it in your code like you normally did, then you have to tell MPI what it looks like. You have to say, look, MPI, I've defined this structure, and this is what it looks like. It's a pain in the neck, but there is no other way of doing it because MPI is not a compiler. If it were a compiler, it could just look at the same definition, but it isn't, so it's a bit verbose. Uh, send, receive, calls, take account parameter. What about data that isn't contiguous in memory? By data that isn't contiguous in memory, I mean, I mean um, gaps in the data which is not consecutive in memory. You might say, I don't care, but subsections of 2D arrays, if you have a 2D array and you take a subsection of it, that in general is not, in general is not a consecutive block of memory. And that's often something you might want to do. You might want to say, well, I want to send this, this, this block or this block or this cube of this larger cube. Those are not single. So you'd have to do multiple sends or do a copy. Well, there are ways of sending these things in one, as a one-off. So what's the general approach? So you can define your new types in MPI. So what you have to do is you have to call some setup routines, and there are different setup routines for different types to describe what your type looks like. And then once you've done that, MPI says, right, thanks, you've told me what it looks like. Here is a new data type, a new data type handle. Once you've stored that, you store it in something called MPI my new type or something, then you can use it, um, then you can use it just like the other, so some types are predefined, some you create yourself, but once you've created them, you can use them in send calls, receive calls. You can't use them by default in a reduction operation. Why do you think that is? What happens if I created a structure which consisted of an integer and a logical, and I called a reduction operation on it? With sum, for example. So? Yeah. Well, it, it wouldn't actually know what it was doing, and in fact, it would complain. It would say MPI sum not defined for your funny op for your funny object that I've never heard of. But what you could do is you could you I don't know if you if you remember, but for the collective operations, you can the reduction operations you can actually define your own operator. So what you would do there is you register your own summation operator for this new type, and then call it with that type. But that's a bit bit more advanced. But anyway. So some care needed for reduction operations. You need to create, a, if you create an MPI my new type, you'd have to create an MPI my new op as well. But that's, that's a big deal. So how do you define the type? Well, how does MPI define types? Fundamentally, all derived types are stored by MPI. I mean, maybe not in practice, but logically, as a list of basic types and displacements. So a type is said like you know is is saying that there's an there's an integer here then there's a real here there's an integer here then there's a real here so it has a list of types which is called the type signature and a list of displacements which is called the type map so for a structure the types might be different a structure could contain multiple things for an array subsection the types will all be the same 
but the, the but the the um, the type map the displacements will be different because here you're saying my type is made up of uh, imagine this is an integer array my type is made up of integers but there's one here there's one here and there's one here and there's one here so internally MPI remembers that of course it'll remember it in a compressed manner it doesn't but logically it's remembering this as a a, a list of um, basic types and displacements and one of the nasty things about this is we have to start talking about bytes MPI tries to avoid talking about bytes when you send a message you don't send five bytes so you don't send eight bytes you send two integers or three floats but when you start defining structures you have to start talking about byte displacements which is a bit horrible but you have no choice unfortunately so this is how, a, how a, logically how MPI stores a type is a list of basic data types so you can create types from types from types there's a hierarchy but at the bottom level MPI thinks of them as being flattened out as a list of basic data types and a, a list of displacements so the simplest type is is a number of contiguous items of the same data type so you can say um, <coughs> MPI type contiguous count old type new type or Fortran MPI type <coughs> contiguous count old type new type so you can create a new type which is a block of old types and that it could be useful <coughs> so let's say we've called so you might it might make your program clearer to read imagine that um, that your basic object is a block of four well a block of three reals it might be an XYZ triplet you might want to call it create a type called MPI um, what might you call it MPI location no location is a bad word MPI velocity or my velocity or something like that which is a which is a block of three reals okay together so so it might make a program clearer to see so you to send a block of four integers you could use an MPI SN with MPI int an MPI integer and count equals four or you could define a new contiguous type of four integers here I called it block four and use MPI SN with type equals block four but count equals one you always when in send operations you count in multiples of the data type so if your data type is four integers and you send one of them you send four integers and the interesting thing is this is where the uh, the double definition I don't know if I so I don't know if I mentioned this later on sorry um, I don't okay sorry this is a um, it turns out that that if you do a send operation of four integers and a receive operation of one block four they are they match that's legal okay so as long as the MPI doesn't actually care about the type displacement it turns about the map so so for example if I send four integers and I receive four integers that's fine it doesn't matter if the first four integers were sent as four integers and the second four integers were specified as one block four as long as the message contains four integers it's fine they match so send type and receive type technically don't actually have to be the same they just have to be compatible and you can play various tricks but we can come back to that so the first one we're going to do is a vector data type so a vector data type is a block and a gap a block and a gap okay it's called a vector type so this structure can be defined in terms of three parameters the count is two here because we've got two blocks the stride is five because the blocks are five apart and the block length is three okay so a pattern of block gap block gap block gap can be described as three integers count stride and block length and so the, the you can define this operator so if, if I went back to my original example this would be count equals two stride equals two and um, sorry I always forget the order count stride block length we count equals two stride equals five and block length equals two that would be that that pattern there sorry I'm jumping about a bit uh, so you might say well okay that all sounds well and good but who in their right minds would want to send that okay well why is a pattern with blocks and gaps useful a vector type consists of a subsection of a 2d array that's why they're useful if you take a 2d subsection of a 2d array then in memory the, the, the actually as long as you define your array sensibly 
um, this is a subset of a 2D array. So let's think about arrays are stored in memory. Now, unfortunately, we have two unfortunates here. Unfortunately, four and C and Fortran have a different convention for how 2D arrays are mapped into a 1D block of memory. Toss a coin, pick one convention, they pick different conventions. Um, I'm going to consider statically allocated arrays in C. I mean, when I say statically allocated, I mean I've gone... Oh, I can't find my arrays. I mean I've gone, you know, int x of 10, 10, okay? Not some stupid array of pointers which I've malloced, okay? If you, um, so in, in, in C, if you do dynamically, dynamically allocated arrays, then, then there's all kinds of problems because they're scattered around all over memory unless you take special precautions and it all gets very complicated. So I'll just imagine I'm doing proper C arrays here. In Fortran, you're fine. In Fortran, dynamically allocated arrays and statically allocated arrays are treated equivalently because arrays, Fortran understands arrays. C doesn't really understand arrays. So let's keep it simple. So how does it work? Well, this is how I'm going to draw my arrays. Everyone, people are going to complain, but when I draw an array on my screen, when I say x, i, j, I'm going to use it as a, so x, I'm going to consider the, the coordinates i, j as, as a coordinate system. So x, 0, 0 is in the bottom left, x, 3, 0 is in there. They're, they're x, y coordinates. People love to draw, people always say when you say x, i, j, Oh, that's a matrix. I goes down, J goes along. Well, first of all, it doesn't matter how I draw them. I can draw them how I like. But secondly, I have defined, I have defined millions of 2D arrays in my life. Less than 1% of them were matrices. Most of them were 2D arrays. A 2D array is not a matrix, okay? That's right. The CFD example, right? It's an array of, it's not a matrix. A matrix is something very different, okay? A 2D array is not a matrix. And, you know, if you do maths, X, Y, right? 99.9% .9 of the time, X, I, J is a coordinate system. It's a block of, this is some, some map of the UK, which is storing the rainfall, and X, I, J is some coordinate system, I, J, okay? I never understood this obsession that anything with two indices is a matrix. What do you think something with three indices is? I think it's a tense? I don't know. Anyway, I'll shut up now. But, so I deliberately draw it this way just to be contrary, but it's along and up. That's, I, so when I draw a race, it's a coordinate system, X, Y. So that means, so if you declare an array C in C of type of type four of size four four or in four shine of type four four, of course there's no such thing as a two D array. It just maps it to a linear block of of sixteen. But C and four shine have different conventions. So in C, X I J is next to X I J plus one. So the way I've drawn it, it means it's consecutive in this direction. And in Fortran, x, i, j in memory is next to x, i plus 1, j. So the way I've drawn it, it's, if you want to draw them as matrices, then you, you can call them row ordered and row major or column major. I never quite understand what that means. But, so is that, is that clear? So, so it's just saying that if I have to declare a C array of size x, 4, 4, that... Um, x11 is the first element, x12 is the second element, x13 is the third element, x14 is the fourth element, x, well, sorry, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, x10 is the fifth element, and Fortran, x11 is the first one, it's x21, which is the second one. So in C, last index moves fastest, and Fortran, first index moves fastest. Um, so that's just, so, so if, I, if I declare a C array, of size five by four, and I want to and I and, and I want to select this internal area. The way I'm drawing it, that means that it's one, two, three, four, five gaps, then then block, gap, block, gap, block back. So in C, a three by two subsection of a five by four array is three blocks of two elements separated by gaps of two. Okay, so it, so that's a vector, block, gap, block, gap. In Fortran. A three by two subjection of a five by four array is two blocks with three elements separated by gaps of two. They just the numbers are just twiddled around in some way or other. So you always end up drawing pictures here and little diagrams and things. But the point is that that that, that, that subarrays, two-dimensional subarrays of two D arrays are vectors.
in, in, in MPI speak. So how do we define them? So these are the equivalent vector types, as I said, block length two, count three, stride four, block length three, count two, stride five. So in one case, um, that's C. In one case, the stride is the second index, the count is the y dimension, and the block length is the, the count is the x dimension, the block length is the y dimension, the other one, the count is the y dimension, the block length is the x dimension, the stride is the size of the first. I know, I know it's, it's all twiddled around, but anyway, that's what they are. So if I want to construct one, I do MPI type vector, count, block length, stride, old type, new type. So I just provide this triplet of parameters, the count, the block length, and the stride. I give it the old type, which might be, this is the base type, it might be a array of integers, in which case I say MPI integer, and the new type is this, this strided vector. So, so you might say, well, wait a second, that, or this, defines a three by two subsection of a five by four array, but I've lost the information of where it is, okay? It defines a three by two section of a five by four array, but how do I how do I send this three by two section? Right? Well, it's exactly the same thing. You just have to make sure you start at the right place. Okay? So you have to. It's like a template, and you have to place it correctly on the array. So what you do is, if you want to send this block here, you pass the starting address as the address of x one one. If I call the object vector three by two. Or you do, or, or two two. So you, in the way I've drawn them, you have to specify specify the bottom left hand corner. So these are like templates. Or if I wanted to send this section here, I'd have to specify this array as the starting address, which is two address of x two one or x three two. So it, it's no different from the way you jump into the inside of an array, but it's just because it's in two dimensions and you have to do a bit more thinking. Is that is anyone is that okay? I mean, it might. Have, uh, there are, sometimes it's useful to, to, to know how big a derived type is, if only to check that you've defined it correctly. So MPI type get extent tells you how big it is. Now, the answer is returned in bytes, which is a bit horrible. But the extent is defined as uh, this distance here, the distance from the first element to the last element. Okay. There's another routine MPI type get size, size, which tells you how much data is in it, which is six. So the extent of this object is eight, but its size is six. Um, it's, because you know, it extends over eight, over eight um, elements, but it only has six entries because there's a gap in the middle. It gets a bit complicated, but the other thing which might you think about what the heck is this MPI a n star extent? So when they first defined MPI, they kind of were a bit fast and loose and forgot the fact that you can't in general store um, a pointer in a, in a, in a four byte integer. So, so um, in, in C, there's this type called MPI a n which is basically a probably a long or a long, long or a long, 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 long or whatever C wants to call it, but it's big enough. In Fortran, they just gave up and called. I think they fixed it now, but you need to look up the details. It all gets a bit hairy. The worry is that imagine this thing is bigger than two gigabytes long. Okay, you can't store a number bigger than two billion in a thirty-two bit integer, so you need a you need a new type. It, it's all rather horrible. Um, so, that, so that's the first type I talked about. It's saying, if I want to send data which isn't contiguous in memory, but I don't want to explicitly copy, how do I do it? Well, I define a vector, which is some pattern of, 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 of elements with, with, with gaps, which is like a template, and I place that on my, on my array. And if I do it correctly, that can, that can allow me to pick out a 2D subsection of a 2D array. Now, you might ask about, what about 3D subsections? Well, 3D subsections get more confusing because they aren't vectors, they're vectors of vectors. And to do that, there's a special data type creation routine called MPI type, MPI create subarray, which you should use. But for the moment, vectors are, are, are useful, uh, are useful for, um, for learning. The other case is what happens if there's a type in my code which MPI hasn't heard about. So both in C and Fortran, 
you can just you can define uh, compound types. So imagine I had this could be a particle which has an integer identifier and a three and three um, a double precision vector of length three, which says uh, where it is in space. So in C, it's structure compound. In Fortran, it's almost identical syntax, but it's type compound. It's the same thing. Uh, these are more recent in Fortran. A lot of people don't use them, but, but they do exist. So how big is that object? If I declare, how big is structure compound? If, a value, if an integer is four bytes and a double is three bytes. Oh, tell me. Sorry? Sorry? No, so an integer is four and a double is, is a double is eight. Did I say double is three? Sorry. An integer of four and a double is eight bytes. Sorry. How big is it? Okay, so you, it's actually undefined, okay? So C is allowed to insert arbitrary padding in here and arbitrary padding here, okay? All this defined in C is that there's no padding before the first one and they appear in order. C does not define the padding. So that's a problem. Different compilers do different things. So most compilers will say double precision values are eight bytes. I want them to align up nicely on eight byte boundaries. So most compilers will stick four bytes of padding in here and to make these guys line up. So, so MPI doesn't know that. So, the, so, so, so to describe this type to MPI, you have to go through in gory detail and work out what the address is of every, create one. So MPI, um, C does guarantee that if you create two objects, they have the same, they look the same. They always look the same. It doesn't So you create one, you instantiate it, you go through element by element, computing addresses and doing subtractions, and then you have to tell MPI. Now the point is, there's nothing you can, do. there's no other way of doing it. MPI is a library. It doesn't know what your compiler is doing. The point is that you only have to do this once, okay? So you define the compound, you do it once, and then you use it for 10 years. So in terms of a course, it seems like a huge overhead. But in reality, you don't define lots of, it's not a big deal. But there is no other option. So we need to tell MPI the byte displacements of every element. In Fortran, actually Fortran is a much higher level language than C. Fortran doesn't, doesn't actually define anything about this object. But we all know what it does. It will just define a structure. So let's just let's just live with it. But technically, Fortran doesn't doesn't it doesn't give it any guarantees about this um, this 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 type. So how do you construct construct a struct data type? You give it a count, an array of block lengths, an array of displacements, an array of types, and you get back a new type. So it's much easier if we do an example. So for this type, which is an which is an integer followed by three doubles. Then count is two, which means that there's integers, then doubles. Okay, that's what two means. There's two types here. Um, there's an array of block lengths of size two. So the first block is, of, is one integer, and the second block is three doubles. So you, you say how many there are, and you specify two arrays, which gives the block lengths, which here are one and three, and the types, which are int and double. So those are the easy ones to compute, and you could have guessed them just looking at that. That's obvious. This type has got count two, block, si block length one, block length three, type int, type double. That's obvious. The thing you have to do a bit more work to find out is how to compute the displacements. As I said, the only way to do that is to compute, to create one of these in memory, explicitly compute the memory addresses of every member, and subtract them to get the displacements from the origin. So it's a bit gory, but there is no way to do it. Now you're a Fortran program and you say, wait a second, I can't compute memory addresses in, in Fortran. Fortran doesn't let me talk about memory addresses. It's not as nasty as C. Well, there's a routine called MPI address. And in fact, you should use this in C as well. If you just use the address operator to take addresses, you get into all kinds of problems with typing, which I've never quite understood. So it's actually much easier, even in C, although it seems very baroque, to use this MPI address. It's the MPI address function is really there because in Fortran, technically, you're not allowed to take the address of an object, but you can hack it, so that's fine. In C, it's worth doing because otherwise, it'll complain about the, the prototypes. So MPI address, you just give it a variable and it tells you the address. Um, 
and it gets the type right. It, it's one of these uh, in, in Fortran. Fortran, it's a bit, it's not such, such a big deal. In, in, in C, it does help. So as I said, it's a, bit, it's a bit horrible, but what you have to do is you have to, as I said, go through and define them all. But once you've done it, you do it once and it's fine. And then it's nice, you could do, call MPI send of five um, my structures or something, okay? So if you, de if you declared an array of, go back to the start, an ar array of my structure, my struct x10, you could do MPI send um, of 10 my structs. Or you could then create, you could then create a vector of my structs and send, you know, struct these these ones and these ones, and then you wouldn't have to talk about bytes. You'd, you'd be talking about numbers of objects and things. So once you've created this MPI data type, it then becomes as if it were predefined. You can use it just as you could use a real or a float, but you have to get it right. So um, yeah. So the final thing is. Once you, before you use a data type, you have to commit it. The logic here is that you might be um, you might be creating a hierarchy of data types. You know, you create this my struct, and then you create a vector of it, and then you create a vector of vectors, and doing complicated things. Um, MPI may want to do some optimization of its internal representation of that structure, but it only wants to do that if you're actually going to use it. So. You create types, but when you actually want to use them in send and receive machines, you have to stamp them as saying, right, this is what I'm really going to use. And that's called committing a data type. You just do MPI type commit and you pass the data type. That tells MPI, look, I'm really going to use this data type in send receive operations. If you want to do any optimizations or do some funny stuff, go and look at this. Okay. Because you can imagine doing something really complicated. You could create an array of block fours and then you could tile them up next to each other and you might end up with an array, a, a type which is really just 40 integers in a row. If MPI looks at that, it might be able to work that out and say, well, that's right, fine, okay, that's, I know I, I can do this much more simply. It's a bit of a detail. So, um, are there any questions on that? It's slightly technical, but hopefully the, use, the utility is there is useful. Does anyone have any questions? There is actually an ambiguity, which I didn't spot for a long time. The compiler is actually allowed to insert padding here, okay, at the end, okay, because it might want to make sure that the next one lines up nicely in memory. So it can insert padding here and it can insert padding in the end. If you look at the prototype for defining the structure, there is no, no mechanism for telling MPI that there's padding at the end, so they screwed up. Um, if you read the standard, it just says, Oh, oh, well, it's up to the MPI implementation to work that out. Uh, it'll all do it magically. So if you're really paranoid, you should, you should compare the size of a struct with the MPI type extent of the MPI struct. And if they're not the same, then you've got a problem. I suspect there's so few, I mean, this was a problem 10 years ago when there were lots of compilers, 20 years ago, when there were lots of compilers, lots of architectures, lots of operating systems. Now there's couple of compilers, one architecture, Intel, and about two operating systems. So it's not such a big deal anymore, but it, it used to be a concern. Now they've probably just fixed it for the small number of combinations there are. 